Good evening and welcome to this special edition of Cronkite News. I'm Alexis Solari. Thanks for joining us. As part of our Cronkite News mission, we focus on specific content areas important to our Arizona viewers. Tonight, we highlight reports from our consumer beat, stories on protecting your finances, your health, and your way of life. Friday marked the end of a food stamp extension dating back to the Great Recession. Most adults now have to either actively seek employment or find a job in order to receive SNAP benefits, most commonly known as food stamps. But as Cronkite News reporter Audrey Wheel reports, with so many exceptions and employment qualifications, it's unclear exactly who will be affected and how. We're not allowed to film on the property of this food stamp office, but we did speak to some SNAP recipients outside who said they had no idea these changes were happening, as well as one woman who did receive notice that her benefits would be cut. By the time you pay your rent, the bills, and all that good stuff, you have nothing left to buy food. Shannon Govan found out today that her SNAP benefits were officially cut. She's one of an estimated 21,000 in Maricopa County who received notice of the changes beginning in January. The cuts only apply to able-bodied adults who don't meet certain exemptions, like having dependents, being disabled, going to school, or living in chronic homelessness. But the list extends even beyond that, and recipients must prove their exemption to qualify. I'm a full-time home caregiver for my mom. So in that process, I do qualify for the program. I got to get notices and letter and stuff from her doctor stating that, you know, that I am her caregiver. And if she can't get an exemption that way. Well, I'm trying to push it to, to where they would start paying me to take care of my mom and then I would need food stamps. Because without an exemption, SNAP recipients must be actively seeking employment, volunteering at a qualified location, seeking workforce development training, or working. It's a lot to take in for those whose benefits haven't been tied to employment status for the past several years. But the Department of Economic Security says these requirements revert back to those in place prior to the recession because Arizona's economy has improved since then. But I think this is definitely more of a stick than a carrot. If we were serious about getting people jobs, we would guarantee them a job work uh, either a work slot or an opportunity for training or some volunteer activities that they could participate in. DES is hoping its initiatives like Arizona at Work can do that. We simply look to these men and women who are able-bodied, who have no family to support, to seek work, to train up for work, and, you know, hopefully get work. But Govan says it's not that simple and that those who are supposed to be helping with any confusion or transition assistance have not been helpful. This is my third runaround, the third office I've been to. It's all a waste of time, basically, because I still, I didn't get no information. The cuts are happening in waves in counties where the unemployment rate is lower than the national average. Maricopa County was the first, followed by Pima County in July and Yavapai County in October. In Phoenix, Audrey Wheel, Cronkite News. They're serving more than an after-school snack. Kids Cafe is a program providing local kids with a warm meal and homework help all for free. Reporter Amber Kawaji is live at one of the cafe sites with more about how this program is giving back. That's right. I'm here at Grant Park on 3rd Avenue and Grant Street. It's just one of the sites of the after school program Kids Cafe. Now it's funded through grants provided by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and it's available to anyone 18 years and younger to utilize the food supplemental program, which serves more than 5,000 meals a day. You can fill the Arizona Cardinal Stadium nearly eight times. Just an incredible amount of uh, kids that are going hungry every night. That's why St. Mary's Food Bank has Kids Cafe, a service offering Arizona's youth a warm meal for free. Here in the Valley, we partner with more than 100 after-school programs and summer programs to provide that after-school meal uh, so that a child won't go to bed hungry. But there's another service provided by staffers the kids appreciate. I usually um, come and eat, but and then I just come for homework too. And for some, a place to just be a kid is sometimes all that's wanted when going home isn't. Sometimes a lot of arguing in my house, so when I don't feel like being home, I could just come here, you know, and the staff is like really nice. And For kids like Victor and Celeste, having a place to go for a meal, help with their homework, or just a home away from home is more helpful than most might realize. Tell us what's good and what's bad. So they kind of help you like 
stay on the right path and all that yeah. stuff too. Including a path to where their next meal is coming from. We know by uh, discussing with uh, school officials, administrators, nurses, teachers, uh, that we're making an impact uh, in helping fill that meal gap. Now the Kids Cafe also has a summer program which provides a breakfast and either a lunch or a dinner meal every day. I spoke to Mr. Martinez and he said that about 60 kids come out during the summer to utilize the meal program and the activities they provide. But of course the most popular activity is the pool. Live at Grant Park in downtown Phoenix, I'm Amber Kouaji, Cronkite News. Since the start of the new year, more than 30 universities across the country have banned hoverboards on their campus. Shortly after, GCU, U of A, NAU, and ASU all joined that list. Cronkite News reporter Johnny Soto explains the safety concerns that come with hoverboards and how that affects business. The lava lamp, Rubik's Cube, and scooters are just some fads that have lived and died out, and the hoverboard might be next as it seems to be taking its last breath. Arguably the hottest item during the 2015 Christmas season. Oh my. Even celebs like Mike Tyson were caught trying to master the hoverboard. But concerns have risen as consumers discovered batteries have caused some boards to burst into flames. A big reason why they're now banned at Arizona State. Our main focus is safety. So until those fire hazards are eliminated and we know that there are no problems, we did go forward and move forward with this policy. But that's not the only safety concern. The biggest thing is just, you know, having someone around to try it and, you know, kind of guide you. Now, if you're riding a hoverboard for the first time, you may find it hard to keep your balance. It took me a while to get the hang of it, so don't be afraid to ask a friend for a helping hand if you don't get used to it right away. Having someone around to help you that knew kind of how to ride it, you know, not just because when I first got it, my friend's like, here, try it, and he didn't help me out at all. Jordan Masters sells hoverboards. Last summer, he averaged around 100 per week for about $700. But with the new ASU ban and fire scarce, sales are down to about 20 boards per week. Ever since then, you know, it's a lot of students, you know, they're like, well, if, I can't, if it's banned, why, why would I get one? Stuff like that. So, yeah, it's definitely slowed down since then. However, this ban might not be forever. Say in a year or two, there are better safety measures for hoverboards and they are no longer a fire risk. That can be revisited and that can be reversed. If you are caught riding your hoverboard on one of ASU's four campuses, the first time is just a warning. For repeat offenders, the board will be taken to administration and the case will be handled by the dean's office. Johnny Soto, Cronkite News. A skills-based platform that connects job seekers to employers launched in Phoenix today. Reporter Chloe Nordquist has more on how this program will help make that connection a bit easier. Hundreds of Phoenix area residents came downtown Thursday for the official launch of Skillful. The skills-based platform matches job seekers' skills to potential employment. The Markle Foundation founded Skillful, which is starting in Colorado and Phoenix. This is a place where there's great opportunity for growth in jobs for people who don't have a college degree. Skillful helps employers find job seekers with the proper skills, even if they don't have the proper degree. Maureen Pusateri came to change her career path. She wants to use her skills in healthcare to find a job working with kids. Employers are willing to, to hire people that don't have maybe a bachelor's, but have the skills they, they've learned through life. and. I like their philosophy of matching it and um, using my life skills that I have. The platform will also be integrated with LinkedIn. We were looking for ways in which we could use LinkedIn's uh, already existing network and capabilities to be able to help close the skills gap. Skillful is open to educators, employers, and job seekers. In Phoenix, Chloe Nordquist, Cronkite News. Arizona ranks among the top 10 when it comes to car theft in the U.S. Reporter Brandy Henry has been investigating why car thefts are suddenly on the rise. Auto theft has been a significant problem in Arizona, a problem that results in an $86 million economic loss for the state. The state's automobile theft authority reports that Arizona ranks eighth in the country for the total number of cars stolen each year. Mike Hassan's car has been stolen not only once, but twice. The first car that I got stolen was a Toyota Camry. I think it's more so a strain on the person who got the car stolen, who they got the car stolen from, you know. The Auto Theft Authority ranks the Toyota Camry number eight out of 10 cars most commonly stolen in Arizona. Others in the top 10 include 
Honda Civic and Accords, Chevrolet, Ford, and Dodge pickups, and Nissan Sentras and Altimas. It happens at malls, it happens at uh, medical facilities, hospitals. You just never know when this can happen. If you look across everything, auto theft, it's, you know, it can happen anywhere. Last year, the auto theft authority said more than 17,000 cars were stolen. Know what's around you. If you're gonna park your vehicle somewhere, park it somewhere where there's a lot of light. In Arizona, auto theft has become a transnational crime with theft rings stealing cars from almost anywhere to transport drugs and contraband on both sides of the border. We're gonna try to find out if there's people in the area that are living in the area that, that have done things like this in the past. Alberto Gutierrez of the Governor's Office of Highway Safety Director and former board member of the AATA says engraving your VIN number in multiple places on your car can help. Your car is protected by actually engraving your VIN number, your vehicle identification number into different windows, which means that people say, oh, gee, this car won't be good to, you know, to steal. It's just a life lesson and stuff and, you know, you gotta just go on and, uh, just, you know, try to be mindful, you know, the next time. Some helpful reminders to ensure your car's safety are to get an alarm, lock your doors, know your surroundings, and park in well-lit areas. Brandy Henry, Cronkite News. Many families from Mexico still on Easter break are visiting Arizona. Cronkite News reporter Mauricio Casillas talks to tourists at the busy Nogales border crossing. Many of those waiting in long lines at the border are visitors from Mexico who spend millions of dollars a day in Arizona this time of the year. The Easter holiday break in Mexico stretches as long as two weeks for some people, and that leads to backed up traffic at the border here in Nogales. During this time of year, traffic nearly doubles. Since it's vacation time, it's taking three hours, three to four hours to cross. Many of the people who are lined up here today are crossing the border to go shopping. Some are just going to nearby Nogales, while others are going further into the state to places like Tucson and Phoenix to spend their vacation time and their money. They're shopping, they're at the malls, they're you know, out, out buying, out doing activities, uh, and it has a huge impact for our economy in Arizona and our economy in the United States. Isauro Perez and his family traveled all the way from the southern Mexican state of Oaxaca to come shopping during break. A couple of gifts, if we can, a bit of clothing and some personal items. His wife, who grew up here, has been crossing over to buy things since she was young. No es la misma. The clothes and other things aren't the same in Mexico. I grew up here in Nogales, so I still search for things I used to get when I crossed when I was younger. Even with a peso dollar exchange rate, tourists say it's still worth it to wait in line because of the price and quality of items in the U.S. They say the dollar is expensive, but comparing prices with Mexico, it ends up being about the same. And there are some people enjoying these long lines, street vendors. We all look forward to these days when there's a long line because when it's just a normal day, there isn't really a line. It's empty. Now, street vendors are not the only ones that look forward to long lines. On average, Mexicans spend $7 million a day in Arizona, and that sum only increases during the Easter holiday season. In the Broadcast Center, I'm Mauricio Casillas, Cronkite News. Southwest Wildlife Conservation Center in Scottsdale has been the home to coyotes, Mexican gray wolves, and other exotic animals for the past 22 years. But the center be, may be now at risk for closure. One neighbor has filed complaints and lawsuits in an effort to shut it down. The center dropped off 180,000 signed petitions to save the facility at the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors meeting today. The center says it's lost nearly 70 percent of revenue due to the neighbor's complaints, although that neighbor didn't show up today. The center now wants to special use permit to have more educational outreach and tours to increase revenue. On top of Frankie the skunk and Moccasin the owl showing support, workers, Maricopa County leaders and even other neighbors all showed up today. They provide such an education on top of housing animals and rehabilitating them and releasing them back into the wild. It's, it's just, it's a win-win situation for the entire community. It's not only a gem uh, for Maricopa County, it's a gem for the state. The center and others like it are the only places that offer refuge for exotic and even endangered wildlife in Arizona. Investigative reporter Amanda Ames took a closer look at why more of these animals are ending up in the hands of black market traders. 
The sale and purchase of most exotic animals is illegal in Arizona and across the Southwest, but that doesn't stop it from happening. Between 2005 and 2015, Arizona Game and Fish issued 88 citations for possession, importation, and exportation of restricted live wildlife. And in my experience uh, of 23 years with the department, and uh, the illegal wildlife trade is, is significant. In Arizona, it is illegal to keep exotic and most native live wildlife as pets, but even so, many people get around these laws. You can get anything online, I promise. <laughs> we have unscrupulous shippers that will actually mark the box live harmless turtles and put them on a plane. One time on a Delta airline, I got a call, uh, the live harmless uh, turtle was rattling, so that was kind of a dead giveaway inside the box. Once seized, many of these animals are sent to sanctuaries like Southwest Wildlife Conservation Center or the Phoenix Herpetological Society. You know, we don't always have these open enclosures like, hey, we have all this room. Um, we're busting at the seams as well, too, because there's so many animals that need homes. There are animals that aren't found anywhere else in the world that are found here in Arizona. And because of that, it's a, it's a hotbed for people to come and, and collect uh, reptiles from Arizona. If you just look on the internet, it is amazing at the things that you can buy. Luckily, um, Arizona is pretty tough with its laws and regulations about wild animals. Arizona's illegal animal trade is unlikely to slow down anytime soon, as perpetrators typically face only misdemeanor charges and small fines. The court uh, decides, you know, ah, it's an alligator, and they give them some nominal fine, and that's where the fault lies. Hearst says rewards outweigh the risks involved in Arizona's illegal animal trade. Now, there's a lot of money in, in wildlife, and we mentioned earlier that uh, the chance of being caught is, is low. Uh, the, uh, the chance of, of punishment is, is minimal. But without stricter enforcements, many of these animals may die. A lot of times they don't get placed in a sanctuary if our sanctuaries are full. That animal has to be euthanized, unfortunately, because they just can't be returned back to the wild. Currently, Southwest Wildlife Conservation Center is home to about 150 animals, most of which can never be released into the wild. With the investigative team, Amanda Ames, Cronkite News. The Somos America Coalition was at the Capitol today urging Governor Doug Ducey not to pass any bill that resembles anti-immigrant immigrant legislation. The group explained that should any anti-immigrant bill get signed, they will call for a statewide boycott. The legislature is once again promoting extremist public policies shamelessly aimed at making life so miserable for undocumented immigrants. Numerous bills were listed. The coalition says promotes anti-immigration in Arizona, leaving many to feel targeted because of their race. The law part of our society is telling people that certain people that we don't want them here. Yeah. And if, if, you know, if they get in trouble with the law, they're not going to be treated the same way as, uh, as citizens are. One bill is SB 1377, which allows a judge to impose the maximum sentence with no parole if a person's immigration status is, quote, an aggravating factor. It's literally in the thousands of families that are affected by these hateful proposals. Some of the concerns expressed today was the possible return of legislation similar to that of SB 1070. They're fleeing po poverty, they're fleeing violence, um, they're fleeing corruption. The Somos America Coalition says if they don't see a change in Arizona's legislation, they will call for those planning to visit Arizona to change their plans. We would not make a decision on it until the governor and the state legislature has indicated by action or inaction their intentions on this hateful series of bills. Several business groups reacted to the Somos America announcement, including the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. They condemned the discussion of an Arizona boycott. Their statement reads in part, instead of trying to damage our state's economy and reputation, they should be focused on constructive solutions that bring Arizonans together. Nearly one in five business owners in the state are foreign born according to the 2010 census figures. Many of those businesses owners are Hispanic. Reporter Chloe Norquist tells us how Latino entrepreneurs are contributing to our economy. Arizona has seen an increase in Hispanic small businesses in recent years, from coffee to kids. Pilar Calderon has a thriving bilingual childcare center. 
In the last five years, her small business has grown from four kids to 50. So now we have another goal to expand it again, expand the business, and we are looking for opening a, a second center. Calderon and her husband Carlos started the business together. They moved from Mexico City 10 years ago looking for better opportunities. We love uh, Mexico, we love our, uh, our country, but we were looking for a best place, uh, more safe or feel more comfortable with, uh, with everything. The number of Hispanic-owned businesses grew by 70 percent between 2007 and 2012. There are now an estimated 123,000 Hispanic-owned firms in Arizona, according to the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Hispanic-owned businesses in the state of Arizona, the 123,000 that exist, uh, contribute about $10 billion a year to the economy. Many of the entrepreneurs are women. Stephanie Vasquez owns the Fair Trade Cafe in downtown Phoenix. It was a rough start. I opened this location right before what we call the recession. Vasquez was an educator before becoming an entrepreneur. This teacher turned business owner started her coffee shop from scratch. I think the big thing is not just supporting Hispanic small businesses, it's supporting small local businesses and above all supporting each other. One sale at a time, Vasquez is building her business in the community and contributing to the Arizona economy. Hispanic businesses owned by women are the fastest single growing segment of small businesses in the country. Chloe Nordquist, Cronkite News. Some cemeteries in Arizona are offering a different way to say goodbye to your loved one. Reporter Ben Brown tells us why some people are choosing to go green even after death. It's called a green burial, something that has really taken off in states in the Northwest is slowly making its way to the desert. I love going to sit with that tree. I'll go out there and write or talk to my mom and it's nice to have still a spot. Liana's mother, Robin Kissinger, passed away after battling cancer. She was a classically trained pianist, uh, moved around a lot as a kid. Uh, ultimately, that I think played into her desire to live in harmony with the earth. Instead of cremation or being laid to rest in a casket with a tombstone, she chose a green burial. We didn't use a coffin, no wood, you know, because we wanted her body to nourish the earth. It's an all natural process with the smallest carbon footprint. Loved ones are often dressed in burial shrouds or biodegradable clothing, placed in a cardboard box and then buried for the body to go back with the earth where a tree or plant soon takes its place. I think people are more environmentally conscious. Green burials are a relatively new concept, but one that is growing fast. In 2006, there was only one approved mortuary or cemetery by the Green Burial Council in the United States. Now there are more than 300. SunWest Funeral Home and Cemetery is even in the process of adding more space. It is something that was, like I said, more popular in the Northwest and in Canada and such. So it was kind of a, a unique thing to, to have offered to them here. Although they haven't replaced cremation or a typical burial, green burials are providing people with a new way to remember their loved ones. And it's amazing, you know, when I go to that land, I can put my hand on the ground by the roots of the tree and it's I know that that was above her heart and it's like very connected that way it's it's amazing Heritage Funeral Homes has three locations in Arizona that offer green burials, including Sun West. One difference in green burials in the northwestern states, such as Washington, they are covered in soil and grass. In Arizona, locations such as Sun West Funeral Home and Cemetery matches the desert landscape of Arizona. Ben Brown, Cronkite News. The University of Phoenix Stadium will host the 2016 Copa America Soccer Tournament this summer. The tournament is being held outside of South America for the first time in history and is expected to attract huge crowds. Reporter Anthony Marquine shows us that what that could mean for Glendale's economy. Our colors and our branding. Marco Medina is an avid Mexican national team soccer fan. The prospect of seeing your team score a goal that, you know, when it finally happens, you just you almost go into a euphoria. He's part of Pancho Villa's army, or PVA, a fan group that travels with Mexico's national team in the United States. Soccer is like an opiate of the people. So when PVA heard that Mexico would open the Copa America with a game against Uruguay here in Glendale, the group did not wait to buy tickets. You kind of lose yourself in 
of what you're seeing in front of yourself. And they're not alone. Soccer United Marketing announced that it's expecting close to 2 million people to attend the tournament. That means that games like the Mexico match here in Glendale could see numbers that rival the Super Bowl. If it's a quarter, I mean, if it's like a normal football game, a cardinal game, we'd be, we'd be real happy. Alan Cryer is a managing partner at Opa Life Greek Cafe. He said the Coyotes losing streak cost some customers and that he and other businesses in Glendale are happy to see any spike in business during the slow summer months. On a weekday, it's 2,000 to 2,500 in that range. It's a good number. But it all depends on the passion and number of soccer fans who show up to cheer on their team. For those 90 minutes, it's so like surreal to kind of be in an atmosphere where people are putting all their kind of like hopes and dreams into, you know, what's happening in front of them. But it, it, I don't know, it, you can't really put the exact word to do it justice. In Glendale, I'm Anthony Marroquin, Cronkite News. When you want to be more connected, friend us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, watch us online. Become a news source for the Arizona PBS Public Insight Network. Your ideas and insights can help us create relevant and distinctive reporting. Join now at azpbs.org pin.